could be here and welcome everyone. We have nearly 40 people that have joined us. I'm Tina Bjork and I'm one of the co-founding directors of LND Cares. And this just is so exciting um, to have this come to life um, as a 2.0 um, enhanced version in this wonderful application called AirMeet. I'm here to support Bridget, who is learning consultant at Skillsoft. I think you just recently landed that, correct? Yes, I did. That the is awesome. Gift. <laughs> Congratulations. And both uh, both Bridget and I share something in common. We're in Southern California. So Bridget's in San Diego and I'm just north of that near Irvine. Um, so, so honored to welcome you, Bridget, uh, for your talk. So I'll go ahead and hand it over and I will get off stage. Okay. Thank you, Tina. I really appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much. For oh, another Californian in San Fran. Hello, Christopher. Um, if you weren't already in another session where I introduced myself, um, as Tina said, I am in San Diego, and I have a new new opportunity that I started at the beginning of the calendar year at Skillsoft as a learning consultant, and I, I just love it. It's a great fit. In the other half of my life, um, also like Tina, I'm involved with ATD San Diego, and it's just a wonderful organization to be a volunteer with. So without further ado, um, you all saw the caption of this session, and basically it's getting ready to share your story, right? So we want you to stand out. We want you, my goal at the end of this session, or the, when you prepare and finish your interview conversations, that you're able to do that mic drop, right? Because you are so confident, you laid it all out there, and it's good to go. They truly met you, the real you. So let's talk about that. Yeah, go ahead, Tina, thank you so much. So I would like you guys, my question is, when you talk to an interviewer, recruiter, whoever, wherever you are at the path of succession there, getting closer to that new role, they are trying to, term, to determine, can you do the job, right? At the end of the day, they need someone to complete these things for the company, for the business. Can you do it? So I would like you to put in the chat, I'm just going to give you a few seconds, what's your biggest fear about communicating your story? You see the job posting, you know you can do it. How are you gonna share that out and what, what gives you concern or fear right now to be able to do that 100% to the mic drop level? Getting in your head and nerves, communicating your success in numbers, right? Grabbing those data points, worry about underselling, I think that's probably universal. Being concise, Andrew, definitely, right? It's that, that, that challenge. I have a lot to say, and I only have a few minutes to say it. What do I do? Articulating well, not making sense because you talk too much. Yeah, concerned with leveling up, lack of confidence, staying focused, yeah, perfect. You guys are all on the right wavelength, and I'm so glad that you're here because that's what we're gonna do. We, we're gonna talk about how you can convey that. You're gonna to confirm to the interviewer you can do the job, right? We know that you can, and now you just need to explain that to them. All right, so let's go ahead and let's move, move on to the next slide. Tina's helping me out to forward my slides for me because my bandwidth, you're all gonna give me good thoughts, decides it doesn't want to su support AirMeet today, so we're just hoping that I stay on live the whole time. So I've closed out all of my other browsers and applications. So what sets you apart? Go ahead and add that to the chat. There's lots of other people that are competing for the same positions you're applying for. You are unique, but what sets you apart? Just gonna give you about 30 seconds. Okay, Joyce, you're trying to figure that out. Yeah. Okay, so Jeff, you've got the advantage of knowing the company and the role. So you've done your research, you're really focused, and you're gonna be able to bring that to the table and say, hey, I know this is going on with your company. That's beautiful. Joan, you're a person with in in empathy and integrity. Perfect. What company doesn't wanna add that to their team? Emily, you've got drive and determination. Perfect, and you help others succeed. Beautiful, everyone wants that on their team. Pamela know how to approach a problem, okay? Yeah, like to position as what I can do. Kelly, that's perfect, playing into your potential, right? Experience in the space and strong networks, 100%, you know, we know that about you. Yeah, 
deep knowledge, Nancy. Beautiful. I know I'm skimming a little bit because you guys are really active and I'm so grateful for that. University partnership, Stephen. Yeah, so again, that network and the full value of recruiting. Perfect. So that, that's what I want you to hold on to that, right? I'm so glad that we're all learning that about you right now, but put that in your Google Doc or wherever you're keeping track because you, you own that. You know that about you and it's a casual place right now and we're all being supportive, but sometimes we freeze up and we forget about those things that you all just listed when you're in an interview situation, right? And I feel like even now in the virtual setting with global pandemic still live and well, that gives an extra level of angst and kind of a freeze up potential. So I just want to share, as Tina mentioned, I am brand new to Skillsoft. I started on January 4th and I really received the biggest compliment. The first person from my team that I interviewed with, she's actually above my manager. She let me know, she said, you know, for this position, anytime we post one of these roles on our teams, we usually receive about a hundred applications. And she kind of left it there. So I was like, okay, huge compliment, right? So that means the odds of me gaining this role were one in 100, roughly. So thank goodness. So, so what did I do? Let's go ahead, yeah, let's pull that up and talk about our skills. So what of your skills fit the job, right? So you see that posting, what are your skills? How did you leverage those skills that are in the unique box that you are? Because it's all about being you to the fullest, right? So I want you to write down your top three skills and you can do them on the side, you can put them in the chat. Um, I wanna give you just maybe 15, 20 seconds to do that. Your top three skills. These can be things that you've gotten positive feedback in, you know, um, evaluations, the things that you put at the top of your resume, the bullet points you're using for your current position or previous positions. Again, as you're thinking of your top three skills, we want to think about what makes you unforgettable and how it shows up differently in your package, right? You and I might have the exact same skills, but they look very different because we're different people. Um, Bridget, this uh, question just popped in. I think it's, it's relevant to the current slide, so I wanted to jump in and share it. Um, how do you know if you don't know who else is applying, what's unique to you? Oh, great question. Thank you for whoever put that out there. Great question. And that's fair, right? How do I know? I might, I don't know if I'm like Tina or not like Tina, right? I haven't met her. I don't know that we're competing against each other. I'll answer that by saying this comes from you knowing yourself, right? I know what feedback I received about me. And so as when I bring that full confidence to the table, my genuine self comes through. And for me, I'm going to leave it at the interviewer, that person I'm talking to knows whether or not I fit with the culture there, and that's what matters. So even with that said, let's just say our example, Tina and I, Tina and I have the exact same skills, but we have different backgrounds, we think differently, we convey our message very differently just by nature of who we are as individuals, and that's going to be the uniqueness that you bring. I hope that helped. Okay, so let's move on. And I want you to, again, we're still thinking about that conversation. You're talking to someone, you're hoping, you know, you're being considered for this opportunity. Um, if you could move, perfect. In a conversation, I'm gonna withhold the answer here. What stands out? So it could be a session. It could be if you're having coffee with someone. What, she, what are you usually left thinking about after you have an interaction with someone? Anybody have any thoughts in the chat? I'll just take a couple here. Connection, how I connected with them. Okay, wonderful. What should I have said, Jeff? Okay, that's being fully honest. All right, let's go ahead and reveal that answer. My answer, all of your answers are valid and I agree with you. I'm also going to add to them stories. Our minds are designed to remember stories, right? Why are movies so popular? Why is next Netflix going out of over the out of the roof right now? Because we like stories, right? We get to sit in. We get to watch something and it's, it strikes a chord with us, usually our emotions. So let's go ahead and move on to my cheesy slide next. What we're gonna use is the very familiar equation, if you are the formula of having you shine like a star. 
And what the STAR actually did include a hyperlink just to Wikipedia. How many of you are familiar with the STAR methodology as a formulaic way to answer a question in an interview situation? Okay, I've got some thumbs up going, reactions there. Feel free to use those reactions as well. Yeah. So what we're going to do here today, this is not just going to be a repeat, but this is going to be really intentional for you to walk away with something. So you're going to rise, you're, raise your level of confidence, and you're going to be able to implement this in your next conversation, even at the networking tables and um, the job fair, I forget what we're calling it now, Tina, at the end of the day today. So I really want you to be engaged. So we look at the STAR methodology. The S stands for situation. This is where you're going to give the background or the context about what happens. So when the interview says, hey, can you tell me about a story where um, the, the pandemic impacted you? Plus, that was a terrible question. How about where you've had to flip content, right? I know this, I saw this a lot in job postings. It was a big conversation going on because that's what we had to do in March. So for me, I'm going to use that as my example. So my situation was, well, we had a global pandemic. It hit in March of 2020. And we all were sent home to work remotely. And I was responsible as part of a team to facilitate a three week long technical training 40 hours a week in person. That's the situation. Oh, and it was going to happen cross site was the term we use. It was going to be in San Diego and South Carolina or North Carolina. Um, so yeah, there's my situation. So if we move on, the T in the star is what's the task? What needed to be done? So in my situation here, we needed to flip all of the content from in-person to virtual, which that meant something that didn't need to be printed or shipped to anyone either. So we had a 274 page spiral bound notebook that accompanied our in-person 40 hour a week, three week training. And we needed to make sure that all of the participants could also access the technology, which for the company I was a part of then included VPN and privacy and all of those things, security. So, that was the situation, that was our task. If you go to the A, that stands for the action. So what'd you do? So for us, we worked as a collaborative team and we created a digital billable PDF workbook. We had to review all the decks, we had to cut out a lot of content, we had to create a new daily schedule, and we had to make it a hybrid of facilitated, you know, instructor-led facilitation, and we decided to bookmark it, morning sessions, afternoon sessions, or end of the day sessions, and then in, the, in between, they needed to do self-directed learning, right? We had to put a lot of content up um, onto our LMS system. We had to work with the managers, with HR, and with the onboarding team. Oh, and our SMEs that we would have as special speakers as well. So what was the result? That's our R in the STAR methodology or equation there. I'll say for you guys, candidly, we survived. <laughs> that was how we felt after the first go. We actually had three three classes that we were able to implement this with. And with the first class, we were just glad that we survived. Um, it was our first iteration, right? We really were using the agile methodology mindset and working in teams that way. We improved the second time, and by the third time, we felt really good about it. it was, but it was a continued collaboration, and we incorporated feedback from the participants, from you know, the managers. We became really nimble with our WebEx meetings, and more importantly, we satisfied the vice president of customer service who needed this to be done so he could fill the seats on his team and have his people trained and ready to go. So with that, I want to ask, I gave you a lot of details and I didn't time myself on the amount of time I was speaking, but when Tina gets a chance to pull back up the screen, I want to do a poll right now, but just in the chat. How much time do you think you have to convey that story? Any, any thoughts? Two minutes. Good. Any other ideas? Are we all in agreement it's two minutes? Do we think it might be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter? When someone gives you the opportunity and some space to speak, and you need to fit in your story to tell them what the situation was, what the task at hand was, what action you used, and what the result was, how much time in that conversation do you think you have? 60 seconds, three minutes, 60 seconds. Okay, so we're really toggly between the, the one minute to three minute mark, and I'll agree. I'm gonna say you have about three minutes. Elevators pitch three minutes. Yeah, John, absolutely. So if we've got three minutes to share that out, you wanna make the story long enough that they're engaged, 
you want to make sure that they can relate to what's being said, right, to what you're sharing. But sometimes, I know it was mentioned earlier, sometimes we say too much. I love to talk. I like being a speaker. How could we check ourselves to see if we're saying too much? Anyone have any thoughts? You can go ahead and just put it up there, Tina. <laughs> so yeah, so my recommendation is if you're on a roll, and I'll say it's funny, this came up in a conversation just last week. Um, if, you were, if you've heard about the cohorts that L&D Cares offers, I'm currently in one and they are phenomenal. I can't say anything negative about the experience. I know Jennifer Rogers helps coordinate that, but these L&D cohorts, one of our, our one of the participants in my cohort was just sharing that she had some interviews coming up and she was nervous as we all are and she was concerned about rambling she's normally a quieter person and more reserved so she was doing her best and she was getting coaching and practicing sharing her stories her success stories and what she's bringing to the table but she was nervous about going on running on right going five minutes six minutes whatever it might be because we lose track so well, I, my suggestions for you here would be for a good break and a gauge of how you're doing. If you're in the middle of a story or you've gone a little bit awry, you could stop and ask, did I answer your question? What about another idea? There's another question you could ask just to kind of check in with that person who's listening to your story to see how you're doing. understand why they're asking the question, right? You can get some clarification for sure. Can you help me understand or are you looking for? And another one, yeah, we've got up there on the screen now is, would you like to hear more, right? So I may have, you know, gone into my story, yeah, you know, we had this class and we need to make it virtual and content and blah, 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 blah. And I might find that I went on a little tangent other than that. And I could stop and say, hey, would you like to hear more? because I just might need that pause. And the person might say, oh, sure, I'd like to hear what the outcome was. Okay, great, I'll keep going, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. And my recommendation here is just to keep it natural, right? Remember, this is a conversation and you're not in a courtroom, you know, in giving your testimony in that chair with a judge and a jury listening. It's really a conversation. And this, again, is where your uniqueness is going to stand out, how you're able to engage with the person and how they feel. Someone mentioned in the chat, you know, what they're taking away from your time together. Okay, wonderful. Any other questions coming in yet? I can pop over it. Q and A, actually. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything. Um, someone mentioned watching for physical cues from the interviewer, and certainly with now video uh, interviews, that's something you can kind of try to gauge as if you get a deer in headlights. Yeah, and that's a great point. Thanks for that call out, Tina. I did see that as well. That one I would say is a little bit tricky, and I would love to hear um, you know any more in the chat about that. For me, I naturally am animated, and so I actually feel like I need to try and pull back sometimes because I'll look over at myself, you know, in a in a virtual meeting and going, "Oh my gosh, I'm like Chester Cheetah, like stop!" But I just I naturally smile, and I can say I often get complimented for that. I'm normally unaware of it. So I think it's, again, that hypersensitivity of like, oh, here we are on video. So I would say whatever it is to be relaxed. I prefer to be standing, so I'm standing right now. I find if I'm sitting, I can just really kind of check out. Not always, but in general, I just prefer to stand if I'm going to be doing an online interaction. Awesome. Well, my final thoughts are back to my story of, you know, being given the opportunity at Skillsoft is be the 1%. Be fully you, right? You stand out as is. You have so much to bring to the table. You just listed out three skills that you have. And I, again, I want you to go in and finish that interaction saying they met me. And that's where I always leave it. I always say, you know, if I feel like I did my due diligence and I represented myself well and they really met the real Bridget, then it's in their hands. I don't know what their team looks like. I don't know what their pace of work looks like, if it fits with who I am. And I trust that if they don't choose me, that it wasn't the right fit. It's certainly heartbreaking, but that's the reality. And I, I can say in my own experience that it's the right fit. And I'm glad that they picked me to be the 1% for their team. 
That's awesome, Bridget. It kind of connects to what Jessica Siegel was talking about earlier this morning on Aladdin and being your authentic self, right? Because if you're bringing your full authenticity to the table, then that's really the best you can do. I think that has been the theme of the day because Sophia spoke to that in her session about, you know, getting a job with a startup. And I think one of the questions in, in that session was about, you know, what about those of us that are over 40 and we're looking for a job with a startup? Do we play down our, our age? And she was like, no, no, you answer those questions. And I love that, that, that star method. I think it's just a perfect, easy way to make sure you're, sharing your your experience oh, thanks yeah. so and i'll piggyback that and said even the, the moors mm -hmm. um the, on the session they gave they're talking about you know finding your your next thing and is it just because you want to you know, quote climb up the ladder or what is it why are you striving for that and is it really the real you you know is it a time to evaluate and say hey like i really don't uh reinhold used a great example he thought he wanted to be a lawyer and then he learned that he needed to read 90 percent of his day he's like i don't want to read 90 percent of my day <laughs> so yeah definitely it's all about being the true you and being transparent yeah a couple of questions that popped up in the q a um, how would you tailor your approach based on the interview type? Because, you know, sometimes you'll have the 20 minutes, just a introductory vetting session, or you might have the first panel interview, or you might have one on ones with additional team members. So is it that you always have your story in your back pocket and then you can kind of tailor it or trim it as needed? Yeah, yeah. Great, great call out and great question. I would say yes and yes and yes. So for me, like for that example of my really great opportunity to flip all of that content to virtual. That was a story I used throughout because I was able to, it's kind of like our transferable skills, right? It's not the only story I told, but it would depend on who I was speaking to, how much detail I would give, right? So if I knew, okay, this is like the team lead or this is the recruiter, that's like, okay, we'll just use a snippet. Like I know the recruiter just wants to know, okay, like have you done this task? But then I wanna give more shape and color to someone who is gonna watch me do it on their team um, and again, I, the first thing I thought of actually, as far as, you know, how to kind of shape it when, in the conversation is I was thinking about disc and personality type, you know, because that's huge too. And I know, you know, who I am and I know, you know, we all interact differently. It doesn't mean I can't interact in a different way, in a different setting, but that is a huge component of how that story is going to become, how it's going to come across and be remembered. Yeah, really good point. And somebody else added, should you have star responses prepared beforehand or do these come organically? I have my answer. Curious yours, Bridget. Do it in advance. These yeah. are not easy to do on the fly. Some, some people can, but I would say have at least three. I would say at least three go-to star stories because again, they're transferable. You don't need to make 20 and I think five would even be a lot, but something, you know, you want to be able to quantify, you know, what you did if possible. That's always a challenge. And I know in L and D, but you know, data driven decisions is what the name of the game is these days. But if you can say, Hey, I did this and I did, I remember it's like, okay, I had like the onboarding example. <laughs> I had the, the technology, you know, flipping vir to virtual content. And then I had, you know, you know, leadership development example. So those were all things that it just depend on what the question was which one I would pull out and again how much detail I would share yeah okay that's, that's awesome yeah I think that's so helpful when you think about nerves and things as well your own you know and you're and you're talking if you're somebody like me who would talk forever and ever you know you've got those things in your back pocket and I think that that um, also in the Q&A there was um, that speaks to the other question of, you know, many companies have many interview steps. So you can, if you've got those stories and you've got them set up really well for yourself, then maybe you can, um, you know, pick and choose the amount that you share and maybe you need to share more, maybe you need to share less to your point from earlier. Yeah. And we're going to actually get to explore a little bit more your kind of pattern of success in the session after the break. Uh, one of the tracks that Emily and I are hosting, we're going to get to do similar to your star, Bridget, and we'll really kind of explore a nice template if you all are interested in um, a resource for that. Uh, we had another question come in on, you know, a method for uh structuring your interview discussion favorably to sell your story so that it's not just like you're responding to a, a cross-examination um and so any other things to add about that it, it sounds like preparing in advance is great 
but then how do you turn it into a compelling story that connects with the interviewers? Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, so I would say, you know, thanks for asking that question. A couple things. One is, you know, certainly the prepare, prepared in advance because then you can know how to what you want to convey, right? You're going in with an agenda as well. The interviewer has their list and things that they need to check off and, you know, assess about you. But you know what you want to bring, right? You know what the highlights are about you, and they're not going to always just naturally land on them. So I would say structure it that way. I would say, you know, have your your top, let's just use the number three again, the top three things you want to be sure that you convey if they don't automatically ask it. So then you can kind of structure it around, you know, if things are going or not, it may not even be a time where they say, do you have any other questions? But it may be a time where you can say, oh, you know, you answer your question. And then at the end, you could say, would you mind if I shared another story with you? Or you mind if I shared an example of with you about such and such? You're just asking a question. They are they're welcome to say no. We don't have time. <laughs> but hopefully they'll say yes. I think most people would be willing to say, oh, right, especially if you've already drawn them in. You know, if they're liking your answers and they're going, well, sure, yeah, we've got time for that. And then you can just sneak in another story. That's great. Um, how do you quantify your successes best? In um, Christopher's position in academia, they don't always look at it that way. Um, so are you looking at it based upon how academia defines success and then sort of trying to match and tailor from there? Christopher, I I, I totally understand the question because that's where I came from. I came from more, my training started in, in academics, a little in and out from that. So yeah, it's difficult. So I would say whatever you can make into a number, right? It was If it was number of participants, if it was number of, you know, meetings that you held, if it was, you know, have you done anything with an LMS or, you know, how much reporting did you do? You know, that could be report cards, it could be conferencing. Um, anything that you can do, you could, you know, say an increase in engagement. And that might be something that's more subjective, but you, you would know, oh, hey, you know, I came in and no one was doing X, Y, Z, but then I did this and that helped draw people out and then they were showing up. Um, I use that in an academia. I was a high school guidance counselor and no one would come to these like parent nights. And so I re I just, it was obvious to me. I just rebranded it. I was like, this is, you know, the event night and everyone is coming. And it just got to the point where when I inherited the program, there were very few people coming. I'll just leave it at that. And then as we built this program over the course of five years, then there was standing room only because I was just like, you have to come. You're coming. You're bringing this person. You're coming from volleyball. Join this person in their car. And, you know, it's just so I use that. I said, you know, increased engagement by whatever it was, you know, back in the day because it was significant. And I, I wasn't using the ticker taker, but I wanted it to show that, hey, I can get people excited and I can, you know, retrain people to understand the importance, the significance of this resource that I'm providing for them. I love that, Bridget. I think we have time for just one more because um, we're we're ending at the top of the hour, I believe, right, Jennifer? Keep me honest. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, and so this is actually a really tough one. I tend to flub this type of question up. Someone wanted to know what the right answer is when you have to talk about your biggest weakness, feeling mm -hmm. like trying to position your weakness as a strength is sometimes passe and it, it just feels like you're just taking the easy route. So yeah. what would you say to that? Do y'all have any ideas? I, I Jan, Jennifer, if you want to go, feel free. I do have an answer for that one. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. We'd love to hear your answer, Bridget. <laughs> Don't dominate. I will say, you know, in general, and I can even think with just this recent interview process with Skillsoft, um, I don't love Excel. I really don't. I really don't want to know how to do like the V, table, whatever it is, <laughs> you look up, right? And, and so I'm just honest about that. And so I know that that did come up because I was asked, hey, what do you think about the administrative back end of things? We do need support in that way on the team as well. And I was like, well, I don't want to do it all day, you know, <laughs> and it's going to be the thing that puts me to sleep the fastest. But if I can balance out my time, I said, I, I want to learn. And if that helps me to learn the back end of things, so I know the full picture of everything, I want to do it and I'm happy to jump in. But to be honest, I want to make sure I have time to facilitate and do programming as well. Ah, I see why you got that job, Bridget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for yeah. attending. This has been such a lively group. And Bridget, your talk was fantastic. Sometimes it's going back to the star basics, really. 
to get that grounded back in what we are really supposed to be uh, storytelling about and mic drop. So thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you, Jennifer, and everyone who was able to join. Yeah, thanks everyone. Bye.